Okay, we're going to get started here. If you remember last time, we spoke about the different liturgical cycles. Who can tell me one of the liturgical cycles? Does anyone remember? One of the liturgical cycles. You're talking about like Pascha? No, the cycle. Pascha is cycle, right? So yeah, I was thinking there, there are three specific ones. Pascha is one of the, we'll call it the yearly cycle, right? So you have the year, the yearly, the weekly, and the daily. Okay, so we're going to talk about the daily one today. And the book associated with the daily um, cycle of services is called the Orologium. And actually, so this is one of two volumes to cover the Orologion, or there's another version that's even thicker, like twice as big or, or bigger than this. So this has all of the daily cycle of services. Now, where do we usually see the daily cycle of services? Generally, we see those in monasteries, where they pray all of them, or in a parish, sometimes we see some of them. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the royal hours. You remember there are three times a year that we do the royal hours, which is where we do the first, third, sixth, and ninth hour with Tipica. Sometimes before pre-sanctified liturgy, we hear about the ninth hour before um, pre-sanctified. But these services actually go on every single day. And so I'm going to talk about um, some of those cycles when the day starts, when the day ends, and um, please feel free to ask questions. Some of this information might be a little overwhelming, especially, I, I apologize I didn't have a, uh, the time to finish a PowerPoint for this, but uh, please feel free to ask questions and uh, we'll uh, get started. So we start the day with what service? Does anyone know? No? No. What is it? No. Vespers. Vespers, right. Vespers. We start the day with Vespers. It's the beginning of the liturgical day. So what time do we usually do Vespers? Five. It's about the setting of the sun, right? That's um, some of the hymns talk about the setting of the sun. So why do we start the day at Vespers? First of all, that's what the ancient Jews did. And where did they get it from? If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And there was evening, and there was morning one day. The creation of the day started with the evening, because it started with darkness. And so, exactly, if, if you were to look at what is the time of Vespers, obviously in a parish setting, and even most monasteries, they have a set time. Sometimes they change the time in the summer versus in the winter. Uh, but generally, it's at a set time. So for us, on Saturdays, we do uh, 5 p.m. Weekdays, sometimes we do 6.30 because that's when people can come from work and we don't want to do it too late because kids have to go to school and we have to wake up early for work and all that kind of stuff. But Vespers technically starts at the setting of the sun. It starts a little before that and then when you get to the hymn, Oh, Glad Some Light, it's supposed to be right as the sun is setting. Okay. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So, Vespers is the start of the day, and it corresponds to the creation of the world. So, how do we start Vespers? Where's uh, where Jackie go? There she is. What's what song do we read at the beginning of Vespers? Do you remember off the top of your head? Song? Yeah. Up down, no. One o three. Way to go, Hori. <laughs> Psalm 103, we also call it the Sunset Psalm, or we call it the Creation Psalm. So listen to some of the words. I'm not going to read the whole psalm because it's one of the longer ones, but it begins with what was in the very beginning. Anyone? The Word. The Word. God was in the beginning, right? So it starts off talking about the majesty of God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord, my God. Thou hast been magnified exceedingly, confession and majesty has thou put on, who covers thyself with light as with a garment. So it's talking about God. Then it goes on to talk about the creation of the heavens. Who stretches out the heavens 
as it were a curtain. In the creation of the heavens was the angels, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Goes on, and I'm skipping parts in between. To the creation of the earth, who establisheth the earth in the sureness thereof, it shall not be turned back forever and ever. Then it starts talking about the creations in the earth. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle, and green herb for the service of man, to bring forth bread out of the earth, and wine maketh glad the heart of man, to make his face cheerful with oil, and bread strengtheneth man's heart. So it's starting to talk about the creation of man even before man is created. Why? Because God created all things for man, right? Not for himself. He, need, he didn't need the earth. He didn't need any of those things. He existed for all eternity. But at some point in time, well, at some point outside of time, he created um, the earth. And he prepared it for man. Then the creation of time. He hath made the moon for seasons. The sun knoweth his going down. Thou appointest the darkness, and there was night. The sun ariseth, and they are gathered together. And they lay them down in their dens. Man shall go forth unto his work, and to his labor until the evening. So again, he creates time. Then the creation of the animals. Before the creation of the animals, he talks about creating um, the rest of creation for the animals, which ultimately is for man. The earth is filled with thy creation. So is this great and spacious sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, small living creatures of the great. Then it makes reference to man. I will sing unto the Lord throughout my life. I will chant to my God for as long as I have my being. May my words be sweet unto him. I will rejoice in the Lord. Oh, that sinners would cease from the earth, and they that work iniquity, that they should be no more. Bless the Lord of my soul. So we start to get to mankind. Okay? So we went through the six days of creation over here. And these six days of creation, we call them in Greek, uh, exaimeron. Exaimeron means six days, literally. So St. Basil wrote a work called the uh, they call it in English hexameron, because that's how they pronounce hexameron, um, which means six days. And so St. Basil has a commentary, if you're interested, on the six days of creation. But then we skip some parts. Again, I can't go through the entire service. That'll be maybe for another class where we just focus on Vespers. But we do the prokemenon. What's a prokemenon? It announces, it's usually a psalm verse that announces the coming of the scripture readings. So we get them in Vespers, we get them in Orthros, and we get them at Liturgy. Um, the Prokemenon is for Old Testament readings during Vespers. Rarely on the Feast of the Apostles and uh, a couple other saints, we read from the New Testament, from some of the epistles of like uh, St. John or St. Peter or something like that. But for the most part, um, they're Old Testament readings um, in Vespers. And what are Old Testament readings all about? Anyone? Sorry? Christ. They're about Christ, the coming of Christ, right? A prophecy of Christ. So look, Vespers is like the Old Testament. You start off with the creation, the beginning of the world. Now you're talking about the prophecies. And we don't do Old Testament readings at every Vespers. I think once upon a time they might have done that. I think they did. Uh, but now we do it for major saints and, and big feast days. But they're all pretty much prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. And you have uh, St. Simeon's prayer towards the end of Vespers. Uh, do you remember, now thou art dismissing thy servant in peace, O Master, according to thy word. So Simeon is saying, now that I've seen Christ, he's holding Christ in his hands. Now that I've seen Christ, I can die, right? So we go all through the creation of the world, through the Christ. And that's the end of Vespers. <clears throat> then we sing the Tripari of the day and call it a day. All right. So that's the beginning of the liturgical days, Vespers. Then we go to Compline. Compline in Arabic is called Salat al Nom, but the original name for it in Greek is Apodipnon. Apodipnon means after dinner. So what the monks do generally. They um, have Vespers, they go eat dinner, and then they maybe take a little break, and then they go do Compline. 
there's wisdom behind that. A lot of times when people come to me and say, well, Father, I couldn't do my prayers. I get too tired at night. My suggestion is usually do your prayers after dinner. Because if you wait right before bed, what's going to happen? You get too tired and you skip your prayers. <clears throat> after dinner, you may want to go sit down and you know, change into sweatpants, but um, it's better to get up and go do your prayers right away. Maybe clean up the kitchen, then go do prayers. Then you go on with your evening. So I'm not going to go over a great comp line, but great comp line is done generally in during Great Lent, Monday through um, Thursday of Great Lent. Um, but on most evenings of the year, we do what's called small comp line. It takes about 10, 15 minutes, and you're familiar with the service because it's what we do after this. We start off with Psalm 50. Psalm 50 is a psalm of repentance, and that psalm comes up in more of the services than any other psalm. <clears throat> Excuse me. By the way, Psalm 50 is a very good one to memorize. Whenever you feel like you've sinned and it's something that's bothered you, say, you know, I really shouldn't have done that, now I feel bad. Psalm 50 is a great one to recite from memory as soon as you do that sin. It's asking for forgiveness. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as big of a sinner as David was, his repentance was even greater. And he teaches us through Psalm 50 of how we should repent. After Psalm 50, we read Psalm 69, asking God to deliver us from evil and evil ones. Then Psalm 142, asking for God's mercy before we go to sleep. And then we do what's called the small doxology. You're usually used to hearing the great doxology on Sunday morning, if you come early enough. But the small doxology is not sung like the great doxology. It's read and the verses are a little different. And then we do the creed. The creed is only done in a handful of services. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's done during uh, the compline services, done during liturgy. It's done during the typica service. Uh, not too much outside of that. The creed is important because it confirms what we believe as Christians. Then there are traparia. Traparia are kind of like the theme songs for whatever it is that we're trying to get across on that day. So if it's a special feast day, you sing the traparion of the feast. So right now, what's a traparion of Pascha that we keep singing? Christ is risen. Christ is risen. That's the traparion of Pascha. Does anyone know the traparion of Theophany? When, when thou, O Lord, was baptized in the Jordan. At Christmas, thy nativity, O Christ our God, is shown to the world, the light of knowledge, and so on and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. So, there are troparia for every day. If not for uh, a major feast, then every saint has a troparia. And a lot of saints don't have their own troparia, and they have like kind of a model troparia where you just kind of substitute their name in there. But there are troparia. And if it's not a big enough feast to do the troparian of the, of the saint, Compline offers us special troparia for that part of the evening. And then we do a prayer called the prayer of the hours. So we say, Lord have mercy 40 times, and then we say this prayer. And this prayer is said at all of the hours which we're about to talk about. So you're going to see this come up over and over and over again. This prayer is said several times a day if you're doing all your prayers. And it's the prayer you hear it tonight. In fact, you say it tonight. Um, it's thou who at all times and in every hour, both in heaven and on earth, art worshipped and glorified with Christ our God. So that prayer is said at all of the services of the hours. And it reminds us to remember God all day long. If you listen to the words. It's very important that we listen to the words of the prayers and not just recite them like da 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 You know, like our Father. How many of us can actually sit down and break up the Lord's Prayer and say, this is what the whole thing means? It's, you know, we just, we rattle it off. It's one of the first prayers we learn as little kids. And oftentimes we don't even know what it means. Did you know, give us this day our daily bread is not actually about food? It's about communion. It's actually, because that's a bad translation. Give us today our super essential bread. What is the super essential bread? It's the, the heavenly food. God's body and blood. So the, the prayer of the hours is said. Then we say the prayers before the Theotokos and Christ. These um, prayers prepare us for sleep. 
And by sleep, I mean both sleep and death, because we never know if we're going to wake up the next morning, which is a theme we're about to come to. And then we say the prayer of the um, guardian angel, uh, which is very important because we all have a guardian angel assigned to us at our baptism. So again, I'm not going through every single piece of every service because then we'll be here as long as those services take. So, um, you know, again, they fill this book. So it, it takes a while to get through all of these different services. The next service is Wait, not one of the hours. Yes, Laura. Is, you said we get our guardian angel at our baptism. Is it the saint, our patron saint? Is that the no. different? Angel, angels are not humans. They were never humans. They were created with the creation of the heavens. They're bodiless powers, so they're spirits without a body. And like angel, uh, like Michael and Gabriel and Raphael, uh, those are archangels. They're like the top of the angels. Then you have nine ranks of angels. The lowest rank is just known as angels, which means messengers. And from that rank, we receive guardian angels. So when somebody dies, and this is one of the reasons that we don't let uh, eulogies happen by lay people in the church. A lot of times when somebody dies, they say, well, so-and-so gained their wings today, or heaven gained another angel. No, none of those things are true. People become saints if they go to heaven. And it's not for us to decide if somebody goes to heaven or not. Um, that's for God to decide. And if somebody's life was truly exemplar, then the church might canonize them a saint. But just because someone isn't canonized a saint also doesn't mean that they didn't go to heaven. Somebody could have been bad their whole life and repented right before they died. For example, the thief on the cross, right? Didn't he, wasn't he being crucified for being a criminal? And then at the last, and he even makes fun of Jesus on the cross. And then at the last, in one of his last breaths, he says, remember me, O Lord, in the kingdom, after he defends Christ from the other thief on the cross, on the other cross. And Christ says, today you will be with me in paradise. So somebody could um, go to heaven at the last minute. We don't necessarily canonize them as saints in the church, although we did with the thief um, specifically to teach that repentance is always possible. Um, a baby or a little child. So in the West, they have a very strict theology that if you die before baptism, you go to hell. In the Orthodox Church, we don't necessarily have this um, theology because God's merciful. Now, if a child maybe should have been baptized and they had the opportunity to baptize the child and then something happens to the child, now the parents might be held responsible by God. Um, but we leave all that to God. Um, but you know, it's important. Sometimes people say, you know, when, to me, I, I might say like, when are you gonna baptize the baby? It's starting to get a little old. Well, we're waiting for family to come from overseas. That's not good because you want that baby protected as soon as possible. Just like we, a lot of parents will say, I'm not really going to bring the baby out in public until they get their immunizations. What's more important is the baptism. That's an immunization against death, right? So, yeah, we don't necessarily, there's, there's no clear answer of what the church teaches about what happens to babies who are unbaptized. Um, but we don't say necessarily that they're, um, that they're going to go to um, hell. But no, they never turn into angels. An even, yeah, angels are angels. They're, they're completely separate it's just like we're, we never become reincarnate and become dogs or mice or whatever. But we, humans are always humans. We always have, and we have a specific kind of soul, a human soul, it's called a rational soul. So the next service um, is the midnight office. The midnight office can be done either at midnight or it can be done early in the morning when you wake up. So the midnight office, there are a couple of themes. All of these hours have themes. Um, number one is to avoid slothfulness and sinful nights. So in a monastery, you literally wake up in the middle of the night to do prayers. Um, again, it's to avoid the sin of slothfulness. But also, one of the main themes is to be ready for Christ's second coming or our death at any time. Because we can repent until the second coming or until we die, but we can't repent after that. So we have to always be ready. And we're going to come back to that theme in a minute. But the Psalms that we read during um, 
the midnight office, our Psalm 50, once again, that Psalm of repentance. We do Psalm 118, which is the longest Psalm. I think whoever came up with this service um, had a sense of humor. He gives us the longest Psalm, it's like several pages long, right in the middle of the night when you have to wake up. So we're very serious, like get up and really like shake off sleep. Then you can go back to sleep when you're done with it. We say the creed, again, remembering even in the middle of the night what we believe, that's really important. Then all of these hours have a troparium. The troparium for the midnight office is behold the bridegroom comes at midnight. Where else do we hear that? What is, when is it, sorry? I, I can't hear. Holy week. Holy week, yes. Yeah, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, all week you hear it. So that's the theme. Remember, I was telling you there's a theme, and the theme usually comes out in the troparion of the um, service is behold, the bridegroom comes at midnight. So at midnight, you're told to wake up to start praying, right? So that's a sign. That's a sign that we should be ready at all times with our, uh, with our repentance. Then we do the prayer of the hours again. Uh, that would all times and in every hour, both in heaven and on earth, are worshiped and glorified, O Christ our God, so and so. And then we do um, the prayer of the midnight office. And then there's another Psalm, Psalm 120, which is looking to God for help and not relying on one's own self for, um, for anything. Then we have Psalm 123, and it's talking about blessing the Lord even in the nighttime. And then we have some more troparia. We have a prayer for the departed. And then uh, the Psalms and the troparia change depending on what part of the week you're doing them on. So during the week, there's a certain set of Psalms and prayers. Um, during the weekend, on Saturday night, it's different than Sunday night, and so on. Then when you wake up in the morning, it's not part of the hours necessarily, but there are morning prayers. And these are morning prayers that we should all do. They take probably five to 10 minutes. And the theme is to thank God for giving us another day and blessing us for the coming day. So by starting off the day thankful that God could have chosen to take us in the middle of the night when we weren't prepared, but he gave us another day. And so we thank God for that. So when you start your day thanking God, that kind of puts you on the right path, uh, the right mentality for the rest of the day. After the midnight office, any questions, by the way, up until here? Okay. <clears throat> the next service in the daily cycle is called orthros, or matins. So you're used to hearing matins. Matins is a Latin word. Orthros is the Greek version of the word. Um, and it means dawn. So the early morning. So what time is Orthros supposed to be? Again, if you follow like a liturgical schedule, the end of Matins at the doxology is supposed to be as the sun is coming up. Glory to thee who has shown us the light, just as the light is showing up. Now, of course, if we did that, we'd have even less people than we already have at Orthros. So, but actually this is something that in a monastery, usually they start Orthros around 3 or 4 p.m. Or I mean a.m., depending on the, on the monastery. So they really start early. Uh, the first part of Orthros, Psalms 19 and 20, they're called the Royal Psalms. Generally in parish practice, we only see those Royal Psalms during um, Holy Week, but they could be done all the time. Then we uh, pray the Troparia of the Holy Cross. And then we do what's called the Exop Salmos. Those are the six Psalms. Who remembers the explanation I gave during Holy Week about the six Psalm readings and what's going on at that point? Anyone? Praying for your souls. So actually the six Psalms is representing your judgment on Judgment Day. And that's why I'm trying to now teach that we're actually supposed to be standing during those Psalms. Why do we stand? Because what are you going to sit and slouch, you know, and be like this in front of Christ during your judgment? No, you're going to be standing up shaking. And in fact, no motion is supposed to go on at all during the six Psalm readings. Just like in the Gospel... Amelia. <laughs> Just like in, in uh, the gospel, no one's supposed to enter the church, no one's supposed to leave the church. Um, the same thing during the six Psalms, no one's supposed to enter or leave during those times. No one's supposed to move. In fact, you're not even supposed to make the sign of the cross. Even in between the six Psalms, after the first three, 
It says, Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Alleluia, 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 glory to thee, O God, etc. You're not even supposed to make the sign of the cross. The only movement that goes on during those six psalms is the priest. In between the three, first three psalms and the second three psalms, the priest leaves the altar, which is heaven, right? He comes out and he stands in front of the icon of Christ. The Christ also, uh, I'm sorry, the priest also makes the sign of the cross because the priest is not praying the same prayer as you are. He's praying prayers for you during your um, judgment. So the prayers I'm doing are different than what you're doing. So you, that's a time you can't look at the priest and be like, oh, the priest is crossing himself. I'm going to cross him myself. I'm doing completely separate prayers. Yes, Jackie. Whenever I'm doing the first three, three songs, are you saying prayers? Yeah. There are 12 prayers that I say. The first six get done behind the altar, and the last six get done outside the altar. And I have to kind of like do them kind of speedily too, because then I'll run out of time if I don't do that. The harder ones I actually do are the silent prayers I do. They're called the lamp lighting prayers at Vespers, as you're reading Psalm 103. Then I have seven prayers to read during that time. And I gotta like zip through them. Um, they're actually in the, the red service books and the pews have them. Uh, but they're really, I mean, it's good for you to read them just to know them. But while the Psalms are going on, your job is to pray the Psalms. My job is to pray for you. Um, and we have, you know, there's, there's a real difference between the priest and the people. Not in the sense that the priest is going to get judged any less. He's going to get judged harder, actually. But because the priest has a special... Responsibility. Remember, it's Christ's priesthood. So I represent Christ in that service. So after the reading of the Psalms, of course, I'm not going to go over again every single part of the service, but we have the Troparia of the day so that we know what we're celebrating. We have the Kathismata readings. Now, in Orthros, in the parish, when we see Kathismata, we know that there are some hymns that we hear either read or chanted, but that's actually not what the Kathismata are. The Kathismata are actually psalm readings. So like during the pre-sanctified liturgy, when you see kathismata there, that's what the real kathismata are. They're actually groups of, of uh, psalms. Generally, and this isn't always the rule, but generally there are nine psalms in each kathisma. Kathismata is plural for kathisma. So there are nine psalms usually in each. So if we did what we're supposed to do at Vespers, um, Right after the Great Actenia, at the beginning of the service, so we read the first psalm, then we do the Great Actenia, and then we're supposed to read nine more psalms, broken up by um, Actenias. In Orthros, we would be doing something like um, three kathisma, two or three, depending on the day. So it's a lot of psalms. Orthros, if you do the entire Orthros, it takes a good two, two and a half hours to do. So when people say, oh, Father, you went over, it's, you know, 1035, or 1040, you know, you're lucky we're not doing the whole Orthros, then it'll really be late before we get to um, the rest of it. What you hear, the kathismata, like you see in the printout, those are what we call poetic kathismata. And those are just, again, hymns for the day. They're technically supposed to be chanted, um, but the melodies are so different that most people don't know how to chant them, so it's become kind of a general rule in the archdiocese just to read them. The rule is if you have chanters who know how to chant them, then you can chant them. Then, on Saturdays and Sunday, we chant a hymn called the Evloyetaria, and they're different on Saturdays and Sundays. On Saturdays, you have what's called the Evloyetaria of the Dead, and when's the other time that you would hear those? Anyone? Funeral. At the funeral, exactly. So it starts off the same, Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes, but then the other words are different. So the one for the funeral starts talking about death. The one for the resurrection on Sunday starts talking about the resurrection. We also do them on Holy Friday. That's how we know it's a resurrection service, because of hymns like that. So then we have uh, a set of hymns. By the way, kathisma means sit down, literally. It means sit down. And because there are psalm readings, that's a time that you can sit. But then we do a set of hymns called the anabathmi. It means the hymns of ascent. So we're rising up. What do you think we're supposed to do? Stand back up, right? And even sitting down in the Orthodox Church, if you are in a traditional church where there are no pews, they have stuff around the 
edges called the uh, um, stasidia, you're supposed, that means like you can lean and kind of like be lazy on them. But it doesn't even necessarily mean to sit all the way. And of course, there are exceptions for anyone who can't stand. Then, um, and now there are different kinds of orthro services. There are daily orthros for the regular days when there's nothing special going on. There are festal orthros for feast days and major saints. And then there's Sunday orthros. And then there's even Saturday orthros. So sometimes there's a gospel reading, sometimes there's not a gospel reading. On Sundays, there are almost always gospel readings. And the name of the gospel reading is called the Iothina, or Iothina, plural. <clears throat> the Iothina, you have the gospel reading, the Ex Apostolaria, which we'll talk about later, and the what's called the Oxasticon of the Praises. <clears throat> Again, I'll get to that later. Um, those are all three <clears throat> linked together on Sundays for the Eothenon. What is the Eothenon? There are 11 of them, and they are all the gospel lessons of the resurrection are broken up into 11 different pericopes. There's one from Matthew, two from Mark, three from Luke, and guess how many from John? No, five. So it goes one, two, three, and five, so that you get the 11. I like to ask that question because... <laughs> Seems obvious, but it's not. So, uh, yeah, then we hear, and, and where does the priest read that gospel? If you notice, there's a difference during Orthros, a festal gospel. So let's say for Christmas, I read the gospel where I usually do, from the what's called the beautiful gate, uh, or the royal door. Some people call them the royal doors, but that's not the right name for them. On Sundays, I read it from inside the altar, standing on the right side, Okay, why do I do that? When the women came to the tomb of Christ and they received the good news, what's gospel mean? Good news, right? When they received the good news, where was the angel sitting? At the right side, right? So I become in that moment like the angel proclaiming the good news to you, the people. And... Then on Sundays and um, the Feast of the Cross... We read the hymn that comes from the Paschal service, in that we have beheld the resurrection of Christ, let us worship the Holy Lord Jesus, etc., etc. And uh, if we do that or not, the next hymn or the next psalm would be Psalm 50. Technically, on Sundays, as people are coming to venerate, we're supposed to chant Psalm 50. That way, you give people enough time to come and venerate, and then it goes straight into what's called the post gospel troparia. So, on uh, um, normal Sundays, the post-gospel troparia, we start glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit through the intercessions of the apostles. O merciful one, blot out all the multitude of our transgressions. Then both now and ever to the ages of ages, amen. The same thing, but to the Theotokos. Then there's a verse from Psalm 50, Have mercy on us, O God, according to thy great mercy, according to the multitude of thy compassions, blot out my transgressions. And then on Sundays we sing, Jesus having risen from the grave as he foretold hath given us life eternal to great mercy. On other days of the week, for special feast days or whatever, um, there are other hymns that are specific to that feast. Um, and then we go into the canon. Did you have a question? Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> then we go into the canon. Now, again, if we do all of Orthros, it's gonna be over two hours. The canon is like what we do during the Akathis service. You know how it has like Ode 1, Ode 3, Ode 4, 5, 6. So there are eight of them total, one through nine, but we skip number two. Why? Ode 2 is only done during Great Lent, um, and it's a penitential um, ode. So it's, all, it's like very harsh on us. Um, so we skip it during most of the year. Um, and that's just become part of the typicon, the rules of the church. And we have also what's called the Ikos, Contakion, and Synexarion. Those are hymns and a reading telling us exactly what we're celebrating on that day. So the church is letting us know this is why you're here today. And it goes through, especially the Synexarion. It says like, what's today? It's the uh, 3rd of May. So on this 3rd day of May, the Holy Orthodox Church celebrates and then it starts to name the saints. And sometimes it's a reading about the saint. That's called the Synexarion. Um, after the Synexarion uh, reading, you'll go back to finish the canon. But again, we're not used to hearing the whole canon. We just do a set of eight hymns called the Katavasiya. They're like the highlights of the canon, like the canon's greatest hits. 
Um, and we get through those, and then the priest comes out with a candle, or without the candle, if it's a deacon, he holds a censer, and he says, the Theotokos and the Mother of the Light, let us honor and magnify in song. And we start singing hymns to the Theotokos. Now there are nine different biblical odes or canticles. You might not even know this. If you've ever looked inside of the book called the Psalter, which isn't about putting salt on your food, it's a book um, with the psalm of the Psalms. At the end of the Psalter, you have the nine biblical odes, and those are odes that if you did the canon like you're supposed to, you insert these different verses from the Bible. So, does anyone know any of the songs from the Bible? What are the different songs? Songs. Miriam's song. song from uh, Exodus. From Exodus. What other songs are there? Magnificat, and that's for nine, uh, the Ode 9, because it comes from the New Testament, for the Theotokos. So ninth Ode is always for the Theotokos. So you have the, what's the Magnificat, or that's that dialogue she has with Elizabeth in uh, Luke. Uh, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And that's where we're doing it correct, um, during, like the, the more of the full thing during Orthros. So we do that, and then you usually hear the hymn, More Honorable Than the Cherubim, More Glorious Beyond Compare Than the Seraphim. Then we do the next verse, the refrain, the next verse. So you have the song of Moses, the song of Miriam. You have the song of the Three Holy Children, usually that's Ode 8, and other biblical um, songs from the Old Testament. So those all get done there, except, of course, in parish practice, we generally don't do them, but in monasteries they do. Um, then we have a set of hymns called the Ex Apostolaria. Remember, any time in these things you hear like an I-A at the end, that's plural. O-N is singular. So Ex Apostolarion means one hymn. Ex Apostolaria means the group of them. Ex Apostolaria are hymns, again, for the saint or the feast. Remember, on Sundays it's for the Eothenon, so for that resurrection. And then you go into the praises, and depending on if it's a daily orthros, which is less celebratory, versus a Sunday or festal orthros, um, on a daily orthros, you read straight through Psalms 148 through 150. So three Psalms, you read them straight through. So, uh, on Sundays, you usually chant the first two verses. If we kept the older practice, then we would sing the rest of those Psalms, going back and forth, just like we do at Vespers with the set of watch the Lord verses. We would sing them back and forth for time, Again, they have cut those out in parish practice. And then we start to insert hymns at the different uh, <clears throat> points. <coughs> Excuse me. The different points of the um, praises. And then you get to the last two hymns. We call them for short, Dhoksa, which is the word for glory. But that hymn is called the Dhoksa Stikon. And again, it's about that theme for the day, whatever it is, whether it's for the Eothena, for the special saint, for the feast day. And then you have a hymn after that that starts both now and ever into the ages of ages, amen, called the Theotokion. The Theotokion is a hymn usually to the Theotokos, right? On Wednesdays and Fridays, you have hymns called the Stavro Theotokion, which means for the cross and the Virgin Mary, because those are the days of, that we remember the crucifixion of Christ. After that, you have a doxology. Again, daily orthos, you have a small doxology, just like the one we do at Small Compline, but instead of every night we praise thee, it's every day we praise thee. Uh, and then the great doxology is the one that's sung where the lights are on, and the curtain gets flung open, and the whole thing. And then we do the troparion of the day again, and then we start with uh, the liturgy, or in some practices, they go on. Now, there are also some parts of Orthros that we don't do out loud, but I do them quietly in the altar with whoever I have assisting me. There are two more sets of Ectenias and like the whole dismissal. So Orthros, just like Vespers has the close of Orthros, uh, the close of Vespers, Orthros has the same, almost the same thing. So I have to close out Orthros, which you don't even hear. Any questions on Orthros? I know it's a ton. Yes, Jackie. Um, So the ex apostolarion is either in tone two or tone three, like you said. Um, there are there are different melodies within those tone two and tone three, but um, always those two tones, and it just depends on the composer of the hymn, how they wrote it, what what tone they chose, and which melody. 
The doxology is always based on the tone of the hymn before it. Usually the doxastikon, sometimes the theotokion. Like for some major feasts, you might have the doxa in tone two, and then the both now in tone six, and then the doxology would be in tone six. So that's how the doxology's tone is chosen. Okay, any other questions on orthros? Yes? So when we venerate the gospel book during orthros, mm -hmm. is there a certain place that we should or should not kiss it? Yeah, so first of all, that only happens on Sundays of the resurrection. So if we celebrate Christmas on a Sunday, you wouldn't do it that day. Um, but when I do bring it out, there's an icon right in the middle that is of the resurrection. That's what you're, because I just proclaimed the resurrection to you, so you're coming and kissing the resurrection. Okay? Um, and that's why I don't bring it out on other days. So you're worshiping the resurrection on that day. Good questions. Okay, so then we go to the first hour. Now, first hour, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, um, they correspond with different times of the day. First hour doesn't mean 1 a.m. It's approximately 6 a.m. So the first hour is about 6 a.m. So again, if you started Orthros when you were supposed to, like 3 or 4 in the morning, you're doing the first hour right about 6 a.m. <clears throat> These have to do with the ancient Byzantine times. The theme is morning prayer. It's um, asking to guide our steps throughout the day. We read Psalms 5, 89, and 100. I almost feel like I'm calling out um, bingo numbers or something, or lotto. <clears throat> then there's Traparia. Then we have the prayer of the hours. Again, we hear that in every hour. And then we have the prayer specifically for the first hour. O Christ, the true light, who does enlighten and sanctify every man that cometh into the world, let the light of thy countenance be signed upon us, that in it we may behold the unapproachable, the, the unapproachable light and guide our steps in the performance of thy commandments by the intercessions of thine all immaculate mother and of all the saints, amen. You see the theme of the hour comes forth during this prayer of the hours. Then there are hymns of the first hour. There are two different hymns of the first hour. That's the only one that gets two hymns. The first one is in the morning, hearken unto my voice, O my King and my God. The second one is, My steps do thou direct according to thy saying, and let no iniquity have dominion over me. So again, we know the theme by what we're praying. Third hour corresponds approximately to 9 a.m. <clears throat> the theme is remembrance of the Holy Spirit's descent on Pentecost. So around 9 a.m., the disciples were sitting in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit descended upon them. So we remember at that time. So it's almost like we're living what's called the divine economy, <clears throat> which is Christ's plan for salvation, we're reliving it at that time. So at nine o'clock, if you stop and say your prayers, you remember that that's exactly the time the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles. We read Psalms 16, 24, and 50. Again, that Psalm 50, they figure at that point of the day, you've already done plenty of sinning. You better ask for forgiveness again. Then we do the traparia of the day or of the sixth hour. Then we do the prayer of the hours once again, and then the prayer of the third hour, um, which I didn't put in here, I think it was very long, but you get the idea. Then the hymn of the third hour, O Lord, who at the third hour did send down thine all Holy Spirit upon thy disciples and apostles, take not him from us, O good one, but renew him in us who pray unto thee. So again, it's reminding us why we're there. Sixth hour corresponds with about noon, 12 o'clock. So the theme, Christ's crucifixion. What happened in the Gospel of John specifically? Um, John points out that Christ is sentenced to death by Pilate at the sixth hour, which means right at noon. And if you follow actually the time of everything going on, it's really amazing. Because remember, they start from the night before with Jesus Christ being arrested. So he gets no sleep that whole night and he's up at noon. He's already been beaten at this point, scourged, and now at 12, he's sentenced to death. He takes his cross, he carries it to Golgotha with help of Simon of Cyrene. So that's what we're experiencing. So we get to noon, right? What do we think of at noon? Lunch. It's time to eat. Well, instead of that, how about if we think about Christ crucified, right? That would help... Um, that would help us probably not to eat too much if we were thinking about Christ's crucifixion right before we eat. Um, 
And it keeps us sober throughout the day to remember these things. Instead of, you know, well, I was just laughing really hard with my coworkers, right? Not that laughing is bad, but it keeps us sober throughout the day. Or I was just gossiping about my, um, about my coworkers or something. <laughs> I'll talk to you two later. <laughs> um, so in the sixth hour, we start off with Psalms again, 53, 54, and 90. 90 is kind of an interesting one there. 90 is the same one that we do at the funeral service. The, we do Troparia, we do the prayer of the hours again. And then the prayer of the sixth hour. It's a long prayer. I summed it up. We're thanking God for the gift of his son and the crucifixion. And we're kind of asking him to make us better. Then we have the hymn of the sixth hour. Thou who on the sixth day and at the sixth hour didst nail to the cross the sin that Adam dared to commit in paradise. Rend also the handwriting of our offenses of Christ God and save us. Whoa, there's a lot there. Did you realize not only was he crucified at the sixth hour, but on the sixth day, which is what? Friday, right? Sunday is the first day of the week. Um... And Saturday is the Sabbath, Friday is the sixth day. So the sixth day, the sixth hour. And then we'll get back to the next part, uh, point. Um, the nail to the cross, the sin that Adam dared to commit in paradise. We'll get back to that in a little bit. Actually, right now. Um, the sixth hour, there are other things that happen that we know of in the Bible. One, Adam and Eve sinned and fell from paradise at the sixth hour. Why was Christ crucified at the sixth hour? The same time corresponding to the fall of humanity, he brings them back at the same hour. Also, at the sixth hour, um, right at noon, who does Christ meet with? Fotini, the Samaritan woman. Right? What's he doing? He is bringing back Eve's daughter, who is not a Jew at that time. He's bringing her to himself, and she's becoming a bride of Christ. At the sixth hour. So all these things are happening at the sixth hour. Um, Adam and Eve sin is sinning at the sixth hour. That's You have to kind of know what you're looking for. Like, like I mentioned in the um, hymn of the sixth hour. But you wouldn't have picked that up just by reading it. Um, but the Samaritan woman doesn't come up there. But we know from reading John, I think chapter 4, about the Samaritan woman. Then we have a service called the Tipica. Now, this is done here if you're not going to have liturgy that day. You do the typica. Or if there is no uh, priest and a deacon is going to give communion, which he can do during a typica. He uses reserved sacrament from the tabernacle. Um, he can do the typica service and give communion at this point. Um, and the typica will... Uh, uh, let's see, do I go over it? No, I don't go over it in detail. But we do it, we actually read the Tipica without communion um, right after the ninth hour at the pre, when we have pre-sanctified liturgy. And it's kind of a short service. The ninth hour then corresponds to about 3 p.m. The theme, that's when Christ gives up his spirit. That's when he's already on the cross, he's been hanging there for three hours at least, and um, he dies on the cross. So not only does Christ die on the cross, but this is the last service of the liturgical day. Because what comes right after this? Vespers. And you can always tell what day you're in. Because like when I finish the ninth hour, I use the dismissal for, let's say, <clears throat> Wednesday. And then by the time I'm done with the Vespers, I use the dismissal for Thursday. Because we've switched days now. <clears throat> the Psalms for the ninth hour are 83, 84, and 85. Again, we chant Troparia. We do the prayer of the hours as we do every um, hour. And then the prayer of the ninth hour, we are thanking God for hanging on the cross and opening up for us the door to paradise. The hymn of the ninth hour. Thou who at the ninth hour for our sakes didst taste of death in the flesh, mortify our carnal mind, O Christ God, and save us. So again, it's going through the, um, the theme of that hour, reminding us what we should be thinking about, what we should be contemplating. So these hours that can be prayed are very spiritual, um, like 15 minutes. 
if we could take a few 15 minutes out of the day, maybe on Monday do the first hour, maybe on Tuesday do the third hour, maybe, because I know we don't have the time to do it all day long, but if we just get that, you know, some kind of thing and do some of these prayers. So like now at the church, we do publicly the sixth hour. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the sixth hour at noon, um, which was Bishop Thomas's uh, request. Well, I think it was in obedience. Uh, but we do it, and it's actually very nice. Is that stream, Father? It's not stream, no. Um, it would be close to the same thing every day. So, I don't know, maybe we could think about doing it. It's just one extra thing we'd have to do, but uh, we could think about that. It's a short service by the time we get over here. Yeah, during during Lent, it actually, because you, we do the Psalter readings, it turns into more like 40 minutes, but um, maybe we can do like a Facebook Live or something on that. Right. Okay, not a bad idea. So, other services. So, within the hours, there are different kinds of hours. There's the regular ones we just talked about. There are the ones in Great Lent, which add some extra prayers, but also they have the mid-hours. So, you have like the first hour and then the mid first hour, which you just kind of do them all together as one, but that's what makes it really long. Then you have the royal hours, which happens three times a year. Can anyone name the three feasts that we do the royal hours for? Yeah, Saturday morning and Holy Holy Saturday, Nativity, and anyone else? No? Theophany. Those are the three times a year we do the royal hours. And again, you can do them at the corresponding times of the day, or you can do them all together, all in a row. And then you have another kind of hours called the Paschal hours, and those only get done during Bright Week. And that's, I put them in the bulletin every year because I recommend that we do those prayers throughout the week. Then you have Divine Liturgy. Divine Liturgy is not part of the service of the hours. Divine Liturgy can be done any time of day or night. It can be anywhere. We generally do it in the morning because we have to fast for a while, so it just makes more sense to do it after you've been sleeping because you don't require that much energy. Fasting all day then having liturgy is difficult. Other services include paraclesis, that's supplicatory service, usually to the Theotokos, but there are to other saints as well. Any of the sacraments, none of those have to be done at a certain time. Someone's going to say, well, Father, hold on a second. You told me I had to have my... Baptism in the morning. Yes, because again, I have to fast before doing a baptism. So I can't do it at your convenience at 3 p.m. because I didn't eat the whole day. And then baptisms are already physically um, stressful on the priest anyway. Um, the blessings of the waters, any akathis, and then canons that you can do. Those can be done at any time of the day. They don't have to be done um, specifically at a certain time. Um, the other exception is when you do something like an all-night vigil. You start Vespers, you can start Vespers something like 9 p.m. And you can pray all night long, so you do Vespers, then Orthros, then Liturgy, um, for as long as it takes, and that's okay to do. Um, during Lent and Holy Week, things get turned upside down. So especially Holy Week, we do Matins or Orthros in the evening, and we do the Presanctified Liturgy, which is a Vespers, in the morning. So things kind of get turned on their heads. And that's it. For